I grew up on the Six Nations Reserve, which is about 10 minutes outside of Brantford. Um, and I was born in Niagara Falls, New York, so I didn't, you know, I, from the age of five, I moved there and lived there until I was 18 and moved away. Uh, high, art high school, I never took art, art in high school because for me it was an extension of my home life. We were always making stuff. It wasn't necessarily art, but it was uh, sitting down and creating stuff so my parents could go out and sell it. And for me to take art in high school, it just felt like there we are again, I'm making stuff, you know. So I just avoided that whole art high school uh, scenario. Although I did take it in grade 12 and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but I still was not totally committed to um, taking that road to art. I really had to establish it within myself and <clears throat> come to a point where I realized that uh, I wanted to be an artist as opposed to making things just to make, but it took me a long time to do that. When I, when I did leave home, I, I did, uh, like I always took drawing classes. I was so interested in learning how to draw and I was, uh, you know, to draw properly and how to make a drawing. And because um, <clears throat> I was, um, I looked at Michelangelo as a huge influence in that part because I look at those books of his drawings and I think, wow, those are so wonderful. Like, how does he do that? And I always tried and tried and tried and it never would happen. And then, I, you know, not until much later, I realized that it was never going to happen. And, um, you know, he was, I don't know, he was just gifted in so many ways, and I just wasn't gifted that way, but I still was interested in learning how to draw. And it was, um, and I still am mystified by drawing, because I still pursue drawing. Um, so drawing was one of those things that I really want, you know, just kind of uh, interested in doing. I also did photography as well. Not necessarily, it wasn't a, a school setting, but it wasn't like a photography course. I was taking a graphic art course at um, Durham College in Oshawa. And it was a full-time course, but I couldn't do it full-time because I had a child at home. And the only thing I could concentrate on was drawing and uh, art history and photography. And you know, photography, it was like the basics of photography, how to put the film into the camera and how to um, develop the film, how to take a, that film into a dark room and start um, exposing the negative and, and getting images. And it's really like basic knowledge in how to do, how to make a photograph. But for me, it was like so exciting too, because um, it's magic, you know, to learn those techniques in photography. And uh, I just found it so exciting to be able to have that potential to take a, to make a photograph and then you know, you'd have something there. Um, and art history has always been kind of interesting to me as well. But, you know, it's, it's like a hodgepodge of uh, art knowledge. I think art history is just so interesting all the way through. You know, you start with Mesopotamia and all that sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. I used to wonder, why is, why is this included in art history? And, you know, then, then I understand why. But I just find um, getting that kind of knowledge and information, it's, you know, it's uh, once you start becoming interested and it's a curiosity that you invest in, it's like never ending and you can just keep, you keep, keep learning stuff. I find that to make any kind of art, it takes up so much time, you know, and it takes you away from your family. If you're doing darkroom photography, um, it's like days you spend in the darkroom and uh, which leads to weeks and it can go on. but. I just found it really interesting that I could take images of my family and also bring them into the dark room. So it's like spending time with them that way. Um, as far as family influences, you know, it's my, my father was an influence, my mother was an influence, 
people around me who just sort of lived in the area, they were always making stuff, not necessarily fine drawings or <clears throat> anything like that, but um, I was aware that people used watercolor in their work, and sometimes they would do watercolor paintings of traditional clothes, and um, I just loved the, the idea that people were you know, painting those kinds of objects and uh, making something quite quite beautiful out of them to look at. I don't know. I was just like kind of fascinated that people could do that. You know, when you're a kid living on the reserve, your influences are pretty limited. You know, going to the dentist and seeing an Arvel Morisot print on the wall, it's like, that's Indian art. <laughs> and, uh, and then seeing those kinds of things, um, you know, I always go back to the uh, to the memory of seeing Daphne Ojik's drawings. It was on like little hasty notes, and her drawings were really, really great. They were really great renditions of everyday life, and it was mostly um, kids playing in the snow, you know, somebody chopping wood. But you know, she could. She was a Michelangelo in my eyes at that point, because she could draw very well. So those sorts of things were the influence as well. Um, just like things you could find at arm's length, and uh, just being really, really happy, sort of being able to see those. Well, my work. My indigenous identity is my work, you know. I think sometimes people um, think, like, do you ever get tired of making indigenous art? And it's like, um, I don't think so, because it's, it's what inspires me. I think if I ever got tired of that influence, then I probably would stop making art. But there's always something that you can look at and, and say, you know, I can, this is really inspiring me to make something. And it's a, like it's emotional, it's an emotional response to what's going on in the world. So I think it's never ending. It's, inf you know, infinite. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I just, I could just carry on making anything every day, you know. I think a lot of times too that people will think that because you're indigenous, you know, your your worldview only stops right in front of you. And so it's like how can they participate in the worldview if you know, if their world is only this long or this big. But I think um, that viewpoint is, you know, like I watch T V and I can see what's going on and I'm really influenced by that and in some ways inspired to uh, make work that has my viewpoint, but it always contains some kind of indigenous marker in the work itself. Photography like, is so astounding because you know it can change that whole perspective just by putting a different filter on your, on your lens. You can have a different uh, focal point in, in the lens itself. Um, there's so many ways of using a camera and uh, just changing the angle that you're taking a photograph of. And then there is, um, of course, painting is, you know, I, I really like painting too. But, you know, you start painting and you're, you're committed to making this painting this a certain way, I find. And it could take a while to finish that painting. And by the time you finish that painting, then something else has happened in the world. One thing I really love is filmmaking. But filmmaking is, um, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, but within film itself you can have like, you know, the frame uh, composition of what's going inside the frame. You can think about um, the composition, think about the subject matter, think about the dialogue, even the, um, the use of music within the film itself. So there's all these layers, even choosing actors who are going to be in that film. And I find it's it's so complex, but it's um, by the time you get all those ingredients put together, it's like that's pretty good, you know. And of course, I can't take all the um, credit for making a film because there's so many people involved. You know, there's the um, 
the uh, director of photography, there's the actors, there's the lighting guy, there's the sun guy. Um, they're all contributing to making this this thing here. And if it's uh, if it, if you're lucky on a good day, it works. And it's like, oh, that's pretty good, you know. So to me, that's like amazing. Um, but uh, I don't know. You can't always have money to make film, right. and I like to think, okay, I can't afford to make a film today, but I do have my beads. You know, I can make beadwork, which is pretty uh, affordable and accessible, and it's um, something that will just keep keep you going artistically. Well, again, going back to indigenous art, it was always considered to be sort of stuck in that rut of, uh, you know, here's indigenous art and it represents this and it represents, you know, the poverty and all the, uh, all the dysfunction that occurs in native communities. So I think people were sort of like, they bought into it and it was about stereotyping and being prejudicial towards what they're looking at. And I think humor was, I can't really say I was the only one who made humor because there's quite a few artists who also use humor in their work. But I just find it an ingredient of, um, of invention. And I like to think, you know, you're, you're inventing something and you're, um, it also has to take on a medicinal effect to, um, to be worthy to, to keep creating because, uh, you know, it has to be like a healthy humor. That doesn't mean it has to be like Christian or anything like that. But, you know, it has to be uh, done in such a way that people recognize what it is and also realize that uh, maybe it's something new that they've never seen or they can participate with, or participate in. Well, I think um, in some ways art, it opens a door and, or a window and people are allowed to peek in through that window and it's an invitation for people to say, you know, you can, you can come in through that window or that door and uh, maybe just understand indigenous people a little bit more that um, you're not going to be hurt by looking at indigenous art. Right. Because um, I think sometimes people really do put up those barriers mm -hmm. and they don't want to um, participate in anything like that and you know it's something that they don't want to understand. It just gives you a chance to look at something else that you normally wouldn't see and it uh, sometimes I'm just so grateful people are making art that I just think wow this is pretty cool. I don't understand it but I <laughs> you know I want to stand here looking at it and try to um, enjoy the energy that that work that art is uh, giving off to me. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that I had was uh, art supplies, buying art supplies. You know, when you're a young artist and you don't have any money, it's like, how can I make art and, you know, and my uh, resources are really limited. But I think it's just getting what you can afford and just moving on and um, saying, I really need this $50 brush. <laughs> As opposed to saying, uh, you know, I'll just stick with the $250 brush. But that's like a mental thing. That's um, me mentally uh, crossing over into that professional section of life. Mm -hmm. And it's just little things like that. You know? Getting my MFA at Western. <laughs> that was a big achievement. Yeah, that was a two year commitment. And uh, there were times when I thought, I don't know if I can do this because uh, it was so challenging, you know, and especially me being the kind of artist I am that is like really hands on getting out there, getting brushes, getting paints, putting it on the canvas, or doing whatever, and then having to sit down and write an essay. That was like, um, yeah. you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but going through that whole process, now writing is not as, a cha it's still a challenge, but it's not like such a, a big thing in my mind where it's like, I, I can't do that. Like, how can an illiterate person write an essay? But now it's, I kind of enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy the, the, the writing part. And um, I think it's helped me a lot in many, many ways that I would not have known if right. I had not done that. Well, um, like I like using film as an example, finishing a film, you know, getting the money to do the film and um, finishing it and getting it done and, and having it screened um, to me is like a big, uh, something that I'm really proud of doing. Yeah. And then last year was an incredible year. Like I received the Governor General's Award and I'm still like, what? <laughs> in May, I received the um, Scotia Bank Award, the Photography Award. Uh, at the end of February, I'm going to Germany to see the book that is also part of that award get printed. Um, I think reading is one of those things that I would encourage anybody to do because I think reading uh, books is like. It's such a, a helpful thing to do, and it's like, you know, you, if you can read, you can go into other worlds and going through that, mo that motion of exposing yourself to these other kinds of environments that are out in the world. Mm -hmm. I think it makes life so much richer for people. And people who live in remote communities, I really think that, you know, if you're an artist, you can find materials that will that you can use to create to make your own work, be it beadwork, which I really think is one of those things that um, I think people should do, anybody should be doing it, because it really helps, you know, in um, just those fine motor motion, motor skills that help yes. you pick up your beads and then you can put it on the material and, um, um, you know, it just kind of makes, it's very simple, but it's, it's also comforting and you know, it's kind of like yoga for the fingers. Yes. <laughs> like sometimes I, I look at older artists and, and watch them as they're talking about what they've gone through, what they've done. And it really comes down to uh, you can't blame people for you not doing stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't blame anybody else. If you uh, if you can't if you're not accomplishing your own goals, you really have to push yourself to do it yourself. Right. Um, so I think as far as the legacy is, just just get out there and, and work mm -hmm. and do what you can afford to do and, and just keep going. Don't stop. I think art is such a great thing for people to uh, um, participate with on an everyday level. You know, you can go into galleries, which is great. And you, when the gallery is empty, that's a better, that's the best experience because you have the art there in front of you. Um, I watch movies and I look at the art on the wall. <laughs> To see what kind of art is hanging in, you know, rich people's houses, and it's like, oh, look at their art. <laughs> um, I just think that it's. Uh, I think art is everywhere, you know, and you just have to be aware of that it's there and it was made by people and uh, made by artists, and just something that we have to really appreciate on a day to day level. Well, I don't know. I don't know how to like. I've been to the Biennale, 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 Venice Biennale for uh, twice, and being there, I had uh, two films to show. The first one was the shirt, and it was shown on the side of a building at a university, just off. I even forget what that place is called, but you know the there's a big canal there and. Uh, and then the next one was uh, in 2007, it was Tree, which is also shown at the same spot. 
and they didn't really, I didn't think that it made such a big impact being there and showing those films like that, but it was, um, it was done through this organization out of Santa Fe called the American, the American Indian Art Association. And uh, the woman who put it together was Nancy Mythwell, and she liked to bring artists together, Native artists, and, and set them up in Venice and, you know, just have like a week of whatever. So it feels like a lot, it felt like a lot of work to be there and to show your work. But at the same time, I realized that my experience being there, I can now talk to other Indigenous people about being there. And it, it just kind of becomes a little bit of a door opener for people, you know, who also are coming through that, that portal. Because um, I find even though my experience there wasn't, you know, I just didn't feel that it was like, um, that was great. It was like so much work and I was so hot to be there. Um, but it, it adds on to the conversation of Indigenous artists being at the Biennale. And I think that's also important that um, we continue on that conversation about Indigenous artists, artists getting exposed to that international stage because uh, unless you're doing certain kind of Indigenous art, you're really not in, they're not really not interested in seeing what you have to do. You know, they expect a certain kind of look to the work. And um, some artists don't want to follow that line. And yeah, so it just, I think it's really great and really important. I think it serves a purpose in the Indigenous community that, you know, we have joy, we have happiness, we have uh, reasons to laugh. There's uh, plenty of things for us to be quite happy for. And um, although sometimes my art does go the other way. <laughs> but I like to think of it as, as being... Um, that's about truth, too, you know. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I only paint unicorns. I, uh, I have to paint or do other things that I feel strongly about at the time.